wrapping up the summer series today. It is truly uh, no longer uh, summer anymore. At least the kids have all started school. We were joking that uh, the welcome table had to take down the summer activity group sign because fall current groups are on their way back. So um, we're wrapping up Knowing God this morning with Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, in keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless and innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Well, good morning and welcome to Current. Before we get into things, I just want to congratulate the softball team for winning the championship last week. That was pretty good. The casual team won the championship. The intermediate team won one game. Uh, it came at the end and it came against the highest seeded team, so we'll, we'll take that. Um, you know how it goes. Whenever you start a new lead, a new division, you're trying to figure out how it works. So we'll come back stronger next week. But gr congratulations to the casual team. You guys did an awesome job. It was really fun to see you guys do that. Uh, as Cindy mentioned, today we are concluding, we're wrapping up our summer se uh, series, Knowing God. And what we're going to focus in on is the topic, God Revealed. I thought this would be a good topic to close on because it really is how we know everything else about God, right? All these different attributes, aspects of God that we've considered throughout the series. He's the God of uh, rest, the God of grace, God to be feared, the God of holiness, the God of purpose, meaning all those sorts of things. We know because ultimately he is God revealed. God revealed. Uh, this is incredibly important for us because we know God. We can know God to the extent he's made himself known to us. He's the God revealed. Um, to bring us to uh, down to earth, into, into our lives, I wonder if any of you here, kind of you maybe you'd be a great candidate for Alpha. You've wondered, man, if God would just reveal himself to me, then I would believe. Now, maybe that's you. I know that's been many of you. That's been part of your stories. We've heard these stories, whether it's before a baptism or at other times in the life of the church, where you, it, as part of your story, was like, man, if God would just reveal himself to me, then I'd believe. And sure enough, he did. He may have come in a way different than what you were expecting or had anticipated, but he revealed himself to you in a certain way where you're just like, yeah, I'm in, I believe. Others of, you, others of you, I imagine, if you're in that place, maybe you're still searching. Maybe you're still waiting. Maybe you're trying to figure things out. We'd love to invite you to Alpha. Or maybe if you're a follower of God, you've been a follower of his for, for many of years, I wonder if any of you feel, man, if God would just reveal himself to me, that would be awesome. Just reveal himself just a little bit more deeply. That would be great. I know that's me. I'd love to experience more of him being revealed in my life. Uh, that's what's amazing about this psalm that we have in front of us, Psalm 19, which, by the way, many Bible scholars, including C.S. Lewis, who wouldn't have called himself a Bible scholar, uh, believe has some of the best, actually the best Hebrew in all the Old Testament scriptures. I mean, this psalm, of course, is translated into our English, has just incredibly complex and beautiful Hebrew, well-structured, and it's all with the force of, and this God who's created the heavens and the earth has made himself known to us. He's revealed himself to us, to each one of us. So today what we're going to consider is how he's made himself, uh, revealed himself to us, and why that actually matters. And not just conceptually, but for each of us personally, how he's revealed himself to us and, and why that matters. Let's pray, and then we'll jump in. Father, we want to borrow uh, the prayer of this psalm today as we 
get into your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, this is one of those texts in Scripture that really outlines itself, okay? We can go in a different direction and outline this differently, but I don't know. I feel like I'd be foolhardy. This thing just outlines itself, so we're going to go with it. Uh, And we see here three ways God reveals himself to us, and as we go, why that matters. So number one, in verses one through six, we see God reveals himself through nature, okay? It says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. Have any of you guys seen the James Webb telescope photos? I mean, they are incredible. If you've taken any bit of time to just kind of peer into them, look at them, we've got some of these images that cover just a sliver of the night sky. And yet what we can see in them, like how many stars that are there that we didn't realize were there or hadn't known before is just remarkable. And in fact, if you've done this, as I imagine many of you have, uh, what I've discovered is it's, it's, what's, it's much more mind-boggling than that. Because when you zoom in, these resolutions are so high you can actually do this, you, you zoom in, you realize that these innumerable stars, these speck of stars, aren't actually all s- specks of stars. A good number of them are actually galaxies. So there's just like innumerable galaxies in the smallest of slivers in the sky. It's just, it's spectacular. To me, when I was looking at these images, I just, I found myself lost in time. It was just, it it felt transcendent. Uh, You know, sunsets will do this for me. Cindy and I took the kids over to the East Bay uh, the other day. Cable had some some basketball games. And I was reminded of these times that I would go up. I used to lifeguard through my undergrad and graduate work over there. And I would steal some time away during my evening shift to uh, take a break and go up on Strawberry Canyon, uh, Berkeley Hill there and look at the sunset at night. These sunsets were just absolutely spectacular because you'd see all of the East Bay, you know, just the inner East Bay, you'd see the Campanile, the campus, of course, the Bay, Alcatraz out there, the, the downtown city landscape of San Francisco, and then the sun setting over the Golden Gate Bridge. It was just like every time I went up there, there was hundreds of other people just out there and you're just blown away at the beauty of it all. Again, feeling transcendent. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. These phrases are quite interesting to consider. So, number one, it says they pour forth speech. Again, I mentioned the Hebrew here is really beautiful and complex and and illuminating. This phrase in the original uh, is has a lot of imagery that goes along with it when it says pour forth speech in our english in hebrew it's conveying this this image of a of a gushing river with streams of replenishing waters of revelation and then this phrase reveals knowledge night after night the night reveals knowledge is interesting as well because if you consider it i mean even with the james webb telescope what we can know in with our 21st century technology uh is is unfathomable how much knowledge we have gotten just from the night sky down the millennia. I mean, you think about how it's enabled us to be able to, you know, traverse the, the globe and all that sort of thing. But even consider this, for, for so many, I mean, even to this day, the night sky has essentially communicated to us that this is not all there is. There's so much more out there. Night after night, it was, knowledge is revealed to us. And the psalmist is saying this all points to God revealing himself through nature, and more specifically, his glory. Here's how an old, uh, old, well, probably old too, ancient theologian said it. He said, though all preachers on earth should grow silent, and every human mouth cease from publishing the glory of God, the heavens above will never cease to declare and proclaim his majesty and glory. They are forever preaching, for like an unbroken chain, their message is delivered from day to day, and from night to night. Uh, This won't be up on the screen, but Aristotle is famous for saying that if anybody happened to just grow up underground and had all the wonderful things we have available to us as humans, but all just underground, and were to come up one day, they would just be like, you'd be overwhelmed with, there has to be a God. I've mentioned this as a part of my story, but when I was doing my undergraduate uh, work, I had buddies of mine, fellow classmates, challenged my faith saying you only believe you're only christian because you were raised that way and after a while i realized you know what that's a valid pushback i need to consider that so i looked into uh, different philosophies different religions just tried to consider all these things without just kind of taking things for granted just to kind of understand what do i believe and what is my own faith 
And one of the conclusions I came to in that time, just, just at, the, at the soul level, if I can put it that way, one of the conclusions is there has to be a God. Like for me, intellectually speaking, it is far easier for me to believe that life is from something, from a, de a designer, a creator, that this, this didn't all just happen by random chance or just poof out of thin air. Like for me, one of the conclusions I've had is just there has to be God. And that's what the psalmist here is saying is all of this, all of nature reveals not only God, but his glory. And uh, what about his glory? We see his glory in, in the immensity of it all, how it's just so vast. I mean, just if you ever get on a plane flight, I mean, every time I get on a plane flight, I look over, I'm just like, man, this world is so huge. I'm just seeing a small little speck of it. And of course, we talked about the James Webb. It's just his glory is in his, is in his immensity. His glory is in his engineering. I mean, in Silicon Valley, I'm sure you guys can appreciate this a little bit more than most of the, the nation. But I mean, the engine, how everything just works so well together in the fine tuning of the universe. It's incredible. We see his glory in his artistry and how things aren't just for like their utility, but there's an aesthetic beauty in just so many things. And we see his glory and his, in his goodness and kindness in that he's created it with great aim for us to enjoy him through. You know, it says in verses 4 through 6 that uh, the sun is something that he has gifted humankind with in, in this regard. It says he's pitched his tent in the sun. Uh, in the, it's like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run its course. It rises on one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. I love that statement because what it's making clear explicitly is what the psalmist has been saying implicitly to this point is that it's all of this revelation of God through nature and his glory revealed through it is accessible to everyone. It's available to everyone. As amazing as it is, it's amazingly accessible to each and every one of us. Okay. So what? You know, why, why does this matter that God has revealed and continues to reveal himself to us through nature? Uh, if you've been around current from, for any length of time, you know that um, I, uh, very near and dear to my heart is the Westminster Shorter Catechism. It's just kind of this nice little doctrinal statement of faith. It's just really helpful in compiling a lot of scripture into these uh, bite-sized chunks of, of doctrine. The very first one is also the very, uh, the most famous one. It is, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Uh, that thought is really helpful. It's taking what places like Psalm 19 are saying here and saying, you know, when it comes to nature, God doesn't just make nature for people, for you, for me to enjoy. He makes it for you and me to enjoy together with him. Nature is a conduit. It's a means for us to grow deeper in our relationship with him. It's where he hasn't just revealed himself to us, but in an ongoing way reveals himself to us. So let me ask you, is that something you are utilizing to commune with us, to draw closer to him? Are you using nature in that way? Because it's an invitation that God gives for you and for me. You know, Jesus utilized nature in this way. It's interesting. Jesus left literal heaven to come to earth. And what did he do? Well, oftentimes when he was busy, which he was very busy, people just coming, whole towns coming up to him, looking for his attention, wanting some interaction, some healing, wanting him to teach just constantly. What would he do? Well, sometimes he would just get away from it early in the morning, away from the homes out in the wilderness to commune with God that way, to unplug for a little bit. Sometimes when he was really busy, what did he do? He asked his disciples to push out onto the lake on a boat. Boy, that would have been my happy place. Just to be out in the lake water with Jesus. And sometimes he would take retreats in some remote region with his disciples just to get away with it. Plenty of times he'd go up on a mountainside. The point is Jesus was constantly using nature to commune with, with God, his Father. And, I mean, you know, it's not a far reach to think, if, man, if Jesus is the Son of God, how much more do you and I need to utilize nature? Uh, Nancy Ortberg, who, preached at current, who has preached at Current a few times, um, she, she 
I've been in a number of cohorts where she kind of does training with church planners and that sort of thing. And at one point, at a certain point, she'll share the story about how for her husband, you've really got to hear how she shares it. If you've heard her, you know her sense of humor. She's, she just kind of, she's right. She just goes, you know, my, for my husband, he'll like read his Bible and he'll journal. Ugh, he'll journal. I hate journaling. And it's like, that's how he communes with God. Like, that's where he just feels like he's drawing closer to God through this means. And, and she'll say, you know what? I read my Bible. I don't journal. But like, you know, reading my Bible is important. But you know where I especially experience God's closeness in my life? She says, out in Half Moon Bay on the water. You know, out there just kind of surfing. She and her husband every so often will go out there and surf. And she says, even if it's a bad day, there's not that great of waves out there. She's like, just being out in the water, you know, seeing the, the waves, seeing, you know, the sun hit, hit the water and just the anticipation of getting her. She's like, there's something about that just makes me feel just a special closeness to God. I recently went through a ministry called Soul Care. Actually, Cindy did it too. It's for uh, pastors for uh, church leaders, uh, and it does exactly what its title implies. You know, it helps care for their souls. And one of the things that was really helpful for me is they were really big on not just focusing on, you know, learning about God and drawing close to Him with the mind, which I realized through going through this, that's been a lot of my kind of point of emphasis, for which I'm, by the way, very grateful. Um, but they were just kind of helping me stretch new muscles, you know, work out new muscles in terms of exploring the space, say, in nature. And through the, the course of doing that, I realized through things like going on walks, I, I could commune with God in ways that I, I had normally just only ever done so, probably through reading the Bible or something like that. Uh, in, at, at risk of kind of being vulnerable with you and sharing something that's uniquely kind of me, uh, one of the things my spiritual director was kind of helped me think through is like, David, how do you experience God, you know, in, in different ways? And I was like, I don't, I don't know reading the Bible. I was like, well, what else? Like, well, maybe when I go on a walk and I just kind of take things in, it's like, well, what else? Through that whole process of just kind of figuring out, I've, I learned something that I already knew, but I had to figure out. Does that make sense? And I realized one of the ways that I personally experienced the Lord, Nancy, out on the ocean, right, catch a wave, for me, it's feeling the wind. I don't know what it is about that. And I thought a little bit about it. Some of you guys know I used to, you know, my parents had us on sailboats as a kid. So that's my absolute happy place, just being out in the wind on a body of water. That sort of thing. But there's something about when I feel the wind, not every time, but there's something about feeling the wind where I'm just like, I feel a closeness to God. And the point I'm trying to make here is not that this is formulaic, okay? That you just need to go out in nature and, you know, work it in and it'll happen. You know what I mean? Like, we're not trying to make this formulaic. But the point is, how can you utilize what it is God has given you and me as a means to draw near to him. And I feel like in the Silicon Valley, we have a bit of this double-edged sword going for us because we live in this beautiful spot, right? Any of you from outside of this area know this is wonderful in terms of like, you know, temperature, weather, you know, everything. It's just the, the, the beauty just right around us. I'm not saying it's the most beautiful place on earth, but there's something we could take for granted here. And yet at the same time, we so often, often do not tap into it because we're so quote-unquote busy. You know what I mean? We got things to do. Can't really. Look, if the psalmist is saying this is a way that God has not only revealed himself to us, past tense, but in an ongoing way reveals himself to us, can you use that to draw nearer to him? Because it's an invitation. And what might that look like for you? I mean, I think you have to be intentional about, about it, but what could that look like for you? You know, for me, I had to really just kind of be handheld into have you tried going on a walk, David? Oh, I could do that. You know what I mean? It's like some of you, uh, most of you are going to be able to figure this out a lot better, but you just got to go out and try to, maybe for you, it's going on a walk. Maybe it's for you, it's walking through a garden. I don't know. Maybe for you, it's your early morning commute. Instead of listening to sports radio, it's listening to some worship, worship music and just kind of taking in the scenery of the 280, wherever you're driving. I don't know. The point is, how can you utilize, how could you meet God? God reveals himself to you. And to me, through nature, and he wants to commune with you, go deeper with him, and he, he makes that available to you. Will you meet him there? All right, that's the first place God reveals himself to us according to this psalm. But what we, what we see here is it's not enough, okay? God reveals himself to us through nature, but that's not enough. It can, it can help replenish our soul. It can, be, it can be helpful. It can be wonderful, but it's partial. It's incomplete. We need something more. It's imperative that we have something more. Verses 7 through 11 tell us that God reveals himself through his word. Okay, so God reveals himself through nature. Now we see through verses 7 through 11, God reveals himself through his word. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. 
The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. Okay, so David here, and in the next few verses, is using a variety of expressions to refer to God's word. Okay, he says the law, he talks about statutes, precepts, also commands, decrees. And the consensus among Bible scholars is that all of these are meant to describe in poetic terms God's written revelation in general. Okay, so for example, not just one specific type like the Ten Commandments, but all of God's word. And what David, the ancient king here, through this psalm, is highlighting are three aspects, at least, about what God's word does for us. Number one, it says in verse 7 that God's word is perfect. It refreshes the soul. Actually, a more literal translation to that is it revives the soul. And look, I, I imagine many of us know people, countless people in our lives, who say that it wasn't until they decided to follow God's word in this area or that, to say maybe no to this or that, that they know God's word says to say no to this or that, that they began to feel revived in their marriage or feel revived in their self-esteem or feel revived in relationships at work or in their mental health. Verse 8 says God's word is trustworthy, making wise the simple. You know, when it says, like back in verse 7, that it is perfect, what, part of what's coming across in this psalm about God's word is that when we submit to it, it's not destructive, it's not restrictive, it's meant to be liberating. Now that's an interesting thought. It's like, wait a minute, following decrees, commands, laws, those sorts of things, how is that liberating? Um, you know, think about it in terms of like the U.S. Constitution, okay? Not a perfect document by any means, but the U.S. Constitution is literally designed not to restrict, well, in some ways that's a whole other story, but and not to restrict liberties, but the aim, intention was to grant and protect liberties. Okay, and perfect of a document is, we know that to be, how much more God's perfect word is meant to bring life, wholeness, and freedom. The way the Bible talks about it, it, I mean, the way it describes it, it doesn't talk about it this way. It's kind of think about it in terms of like a fish, right? I've heard, it, I've heard it described this way. If a fish were to decide one day, okay, I've had enough of being told how I ought to live as a fish, that I can only ever be in this water. I'm, I'm going to the surface. Uh, you know, that probably won't, it, you know, probably, it w won't go well for that fish. You know, they'll get themselves out and they'll be wiggling around and their fins won't work the way they thought they might work because the fish isn't built for land. Well, what God's word shows us is we're not built to be away from our heavenly father and the, and the image in whom we're created to be after. And when it says that he, it makes wise the simple, I feel like this is saying about God's word, what it said about uh, him being revealed through nature is again that he makes himself accessible through his word. It's available to everyone. He makes wise the simple. It means anybody who wants to tap into it and glean and benefit from its wisdom can. You don't have to have a PhD to receive the benefits and blessings from God's word. Number three, we see in verse eight, God's word brings joy to the heart. Verse 10, it's more precious than gold, sweeter than, than honey. Okay, we come back to this objection. C.S. Lewis articulated this. He wrote, he wrote actually quite extensively about this particular psalm. But he said at one point, wait a minute, I, I can understand that the promises of God are more precious than gold, sweeter than honey, bring joy to the heart. But you're telling me the law does? I'm not so sure about that. I can get behind understanding how the promises do that, but the, but the law? And he wrote this, and sorry, this won't be on the screen. It says, this was to me at first very mysterious. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. I can understand that a man can and must respect these statutes and try to obey them and assent to them in his heart, but it is very hard to find how they could be delicious and how they can exhilarate. And then he later on concluded, you know, this is written by a man, that's King David, of course, who's not using language of scrupulosity. His is a language of ravished beauty. He is looking into the law of God and all its demands, and he is seeing absolute beauty, saying God's scripture can make us wise beyond our understanding, and to miss this is to miss out on things much prized after in life. Now, I think David himself in this text kind of helps us understand what's going on here in terms of this objection. When he says, by God's word, your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. So look, I understand the objection. Hey, how do we see that God's word, especially his laws and his commands, how are those not restricting? How are those liberating? Well, we, we are warned by them. We gain wisdom by them. We, they bring us great reward. How so? Uh, one of the things I love to do as a pastor 
and hopefully not in like this facetious way, but just kind of like as I am a student of Scripture, is I'm paying attention constantly to how our culture is processing different principles that the Scriptures teach. Is that making sense? Not even like because of like a study directly of the Scriptures. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, recently, you know, a while back, there was an article that, was in, that I came across entitled, uh, Experts Find Helping Others Helps You Live Longer. Okay? That immediately kind of stuck out to my, my eyes. Um, it, it came in my feed. I'm like, I'm reading that. I'm saving it. The whole point of the, art, the article is positive thinking and helping others, it turns out, doesn't just feel good. It physiologically <laughs> helps you and me live longer. It's like, this is incredible. And the reason why I find these articles kind of fat, well, a couple, a couple of reasons. One, I just find it an ironic conclusion because it's been, the conclusion is basically be, sel- be selfish and being selfless. Right? Help others so that it'll go better for you. Be selfish and be selfish. Okay, that's a whole other deal. But the bigger thing for me is like, that's what Scripture's been teaching forever. Jesus said the greatest commands are love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then the next is love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, love others, not self. Scripture repeats this in many other places. Look to the interests of others, not yourself. And so the Scriptures aren't saying do this just because, well, God will be upset with you if you don't. And it's not saying, do this, and so it'll go even better for you, so you'll live longer. So that stuff is true. The, the scripture's saying, do this because this is who you are, who you're designed to be. Who, it's whose you are. I mean, it's really fascinating. This really kind of, uh, I thought was interesting in my study this week. Notice that verse 11 does not say, for keeping God's word, there's great reward. It says, in keeping God's word, there's great reward. You see the difference there? It's not saying for doing this, you'll be rewarded. It's in doing this, there's a reward. While it's true, if you and I follow God's word, there's a promise that things will go better for us. Maybe we'll live long. I don't know. There's wonderful blessings. It's saying in the very act of doing it, there's a reward built in. Uh, Let me give you another example. About a month ago, I was reading a a book on psychology, that sort of thing. I think I've mentioned this uh, in past sermons. Um, But uh, this is a non-religious book, non-religious guy. But he was making the point very emphatically, do not lie. Never lie. Now, that's in the Bible. Don't lie. It's one of the statutes, the precept, it's a command that's in the scriptures, right? Now, he, here's a non-religious guy making a non-religious point. Do not lie. In fact, never lie. And he says, the reasons you should not lie, one, I'll give you two. One, he says, this is more obvious, although people think it's more straightforward than it actually is. He said, don't lie because you're going to lose credibility with others. And the reason why it's not so straightforward as we often think it to be is because often when you lie and you think they don't pick up on it, they are actually picking up on it in many more ways than you think. And he said, as a psychologist, I can tell you, after years and years, like, this is so true. People are picking up on it. Don't lie because you'll lose credibility with others. But here's the other one I'm sure most of my readers haven't considered before. Do not lie because you will lose credibility with yourself. Now I'm interested. I'm like, what's he saying? He said, there's going to come times in your life when you're going to have to, you're going to need to know, can you trust yourself with this decision, with this direction you want to make? And if you've been lying, you're going to find that you can't trust yourself in those situations at least to the degree you otherwise would have thought. And I'm over here saying, okay, that's interesting. That's fascinating. That's a wonderful, interesting, insightful implication, but that's not why God says don't lie. God doesn't say don't lie just because, well, God doesn't want you to lie. God doesn't say don't lie because, hey, you're going to lose credibility. He says don't lie because that's who you are, who you're designed to be. And therefore, there's all these implications underneath it. God's word is not meant to be restrictive. It's meant to be liberating because we're living to be the people we're called to be. And scripture is filled with all sorts of laws and teachings that have this effect. You know, by very nature, if it's his law, not ours, which is, by the way, kind of important because if it's our law, if it's what we deem deem to be true, that's going to shift. It's going to shift based on each of us and it's going to shift on how we're each feeling or deciding to feel in certain situations. It's his law. And so therefore, it's not up for grabs. It's, but when we follow it, whether we realize it, whether we understand it fully or not, there is reward there, and we are warned. God's law has a lot to say about lying. It has a lot to say about how we care for the marginalized, for the poor. It has a lot to say about how we orient our sex lives. It has a lot to say about being humble. It has a lot to say about any number of things. And we decide, okay, are we going to follow the word revealed by God in his word? The question, of course, here again is, so what? 
Why is this matter? Uh, this one's a little bit more straightforward, I believe, but, but all the more important to consider. The so wet, of course, is we just need to saturate ourselves. If God has revealed himself through his word, we need to saturate ourselves in his word. I've been following a guy very, uh, uh, more, more recently, so I haven't done a deep dive in this guy. I'll, I'll keep, continue to get my thoughts on him. I'm not sure I'm a full endorser, but he seems like a really cool guy. A guy named John Lennox, uh, who's worked with a Veritas Forum. I don't know if you, I'm sure, imagine a number of you guys have heard of Veritas Forum. It's a, it's a college organization, ministry, that sets up these forums, invites uh, thinkers to talk about religion, philosophy, science on the, on the college campus. And John Lennox is one of these guys, and he's, he's a really uh, interesting uh, older Irish guy who studied at Cambridge, now a professor at Oxford. He's debated people like Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, and so forth. Really humble guy. You listen to a couple minutes of this guy talking, you realize he's a very humble, genuine dude, brilliant mind. And he's this apologist, so meaning he just kind of was out there kind of defending the faith of Christianity and, and so forth. Well, he came into my, my feed, and I was watching this, this YouTube clip of him, and he must have been talking to a group, I, I, I want to say Cambridge students, and he said, he said to this group of students, he said, guys, the word of God is so important. He's kind of making the point we're talking about today. So it brings joy to the heart. It's more precious than gold. It's sweeter than, than honey. He said, if, if, it's, if it's all these things, and we know this to be true, we can't just spend five minutes reading it before bed. He said, we have been given as people incredible minds. We've been blessed with minds of, of intellect to think about things, and we apply these minds in the workplace. We apply these minds to different tasks and problems that we face. He said, how much more ought we be applying them to the scriptures? He told a story about how when he was a, ca- a student in Cambridge that a professor there took kind of a notice of him, invited him in to say, hey, I would love to mentor you, that sort of thing. He's like, wow, I'd love to do that. Went to his office. This brilliant Cambridge professor uh, said, uh, you know, he, th- he thought he was going to learn you know, philosophy from this guy, talk big questions. Um, turns out, he's like, he said, hey, you know, he, he came into his office, and all they did was open up to a random text about Jesus and study the scripture. And he said, this guy, together with him, just were pouring over this text about Jesus and just trying to plumb its depths and understand what it, can we learn about God here and how does this apply to our lives? And he said to this group of Cambridge students, I left the office of that guy that day, a changed man. Because I realized I hadn't been pouring into the scriptures and searching out its depths. And I would just say, you know, it's fun to be at a church that's quote-unquote younger with a lot of young professionals. I would just say there's a lot of dividends to be had the earlier we do this. Now, there's the best time to start is now, <laughs> regardless. But but you think about that. One of the reasons why, as young professionals in the workplace, in a place like the Silicon Valley, it's not known for being very receptive towards Christianity. One of the reasons why we might struggle with having answers to the questions our coworkers are answering is because we haven't searched them out in the scriptures ourselves. Or at least tried to give that some time. Parents, I would say, I mean, on, on the, at the start of schooling for, for your little ones, if there's a time for us to be leading out as parents with our kids and helping them navigate this world, we've got to be saturating ourselves in God's word. Help them. Answer the questions. Guide them along. The point is, of course, we need to be reading it. We need to be pouring over it. We need to be meditating on it. We need to be loving it. We need to be living it. If, if it truly is more precious than gold, sweeter than honey, honey, how could you make that effort? And I would just say, let's say you're sitting here like, I don't know how I'd go about doing that. Number one, you could find a small group leader. They'd help you. Uh, number two, come see me. I'd love to kind of give you some ideas. There's different ways if you're looking for like a mechanism, how to start doing that. We'd love to talk to you about that. All right, so what we've seen in this text now is God reveals himself through creation. God reveals himself through his word. And then the best part of the psalm, in my humble opinion, are verses 12 through 14 where we see God reveals himself through redemption. Okay, so what we've seen is this ancient King David, the psalmist, has been just kind of overwhelmed with the revelation of God through nature, with the revelation of God through his word. And this is where he goes, verse 12. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. 
after being overwhelmed at the revelation of God through nature and through the word, David's soul is struck with, and if this is all true, how can I stand before God? And the answer is, I can't. Who can discern their own errors? Keep your servant from willful sins. May they not rule over me. So one of the conclusions I had when I started to look at, like, what do I believe? Why do I believe it? Was there has to be a God. The other conclusion, after all this time thinking about it and trying to do some soul searching myself, is that I'm a sinner, to use a biblical framework for it. That I fall short. That I don't measure up. And, and not just some ways, but great ways. Like, there's a chasm there. And what David is saying is not only is this true of himself, and what the scriptures teach, not only do we all understand innately down below it all, it's true of each of ourselves, what David goes on to say, and we need outside help. He says, forgive me my hidden faults. Uh, that's major self-awareness. My hidden faults? Forgive me those? You know, for someone to say, yeah, I, I can realize I've sinned in ways that I've, yeah, I messed up in that way and that way, but also just go ahead and say, and there's other things that I'm just doing all the time that are hidden. I need to be forgiven of those. And then he adds, and keep your servant, O God, from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Uh, one of the texts that resonates with me, I have a love-hate relationship with it, because it resonates so strongly, is Romans 7, where the Apostle Paul says, the things I know I ought to be doing, yeah, I don't really do those things. And the things I know I ought not to, not to be doing, yeah, I'm, I'm doing those. It's worth noting that the person writing this great psalm, Psalm 19, is, was a saint, you know? Just, this is a prayer of a saint, as it were. I did my Hebrew, I learned the, the, kind of my, my Hebrew training um, at the, the, the Hallel House in Berkeley. It's really a cool opportunity. I got to learn at the, like, the Hebrew House Judaica there. And it, I, in fact, I was dropping Caleb off at a camp, and I saw the same Hallel House uh, over in, on Stanford, the Stanford version of that. And it brought back a lot of memories because it's a similar kind of looking nice house in the middle of, middle of campus. That's where I got to learn kind of the Hebrew so I could kind of, you know, work with the scriptures and that sort of thing. And what really struck me about it uh, was how much the Jewish community on the whole reveres King David. Like, hey, I've studied God's word for a good while since I was a little kid, and I know the different characters in the Bible. If you'd asked me, hey, who kind of of all of them are the most perfect. I'm not sure I would have come to, but David, like to me, at least in that experience, King David was like, here. You know, there's all these other characters about, but this is the guy who's known in the scriptures as the man after God's own heart, and he himself is saying, keep me from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Uh, if David's saying it, boy, <laughs> this really gets at the heart of what not only Psalm 19 is about, but essentially the all of scriptures. God has revealed himself to us, frankly, in ways far greater than we deserve, through nature, through his word. And if we recognize and understand, let any of that start to even remotely sink in, we'll see that we fall short. And yet, of all the things God reveals, perhaps greatest by far, is that he meets us there, forgives us, redeems us. Keep your servant from willful sins, meaning you've got to do this, God. Then I will be blameless and innocent, of great transgression. And then verse 14, may these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Lord is an incredible word here. If you notice earlier on in the psalm, it's referring to God, especially when it's talking about nature, it's saying God has revealed himself. That's the Hebrew word El. It's a very, it's a term of great reverence and respect, but it's kind of a more general word for God. When it's talking about God revealing himself through nature, it's using the word El. But then once it moves towards the word, let alone towards his plan of redemption, it switches to the holy word of Yahweh. In fact, a word that my friends at the Hall House won't even utter. It's such an intimate, precious name to reveal a closeness of God. Uh, it really means a covenant God, but in more our common vernacular, it means a faithfulness. That God is with you and for you through anything, including your failings. He is our rock. Boy, this could be a whole sermon, but this is just to say he's, a, he's our firm standing place. He's unwavering. He's unmovable, unshakable. And then, of course, it says he's our redeemer. Uh, this is the Hebrew word goel, which means kinsman redeemer. We're not going to do a deep dive here. You can look actually at Ruth for, for some more on this. 
But the definition of goel or redeemer here is a person who brought his relative out of slavery, who rescued him in bankruptcy and out of total loss. And David is applying this spiritually to the Lord, that God has brought us out of spiritual bankruptcy, being the bondage of sin. How do sins get free? Well, someone has to redeem them, and that's precisely what Jesus said he came to do. When he said in Mark 10, this will not be on your screen, the Son of Man came to give his life as ransom for many. That was him saying, I've come to redeem, to be your redeemer. He is our Lord, our rock, our redeemer, which is so wonderful. Because, man, if you and I begin to step into this invitation of communing with him, moving towards this Lord who's revealed himself through nature and towards this one who's revealed himself through his word, we're going to be spotlighting the way that we don't stand up. But when that spotlight hits us, the Lord wants us to know we are forgiven in Jesus if we've received it. In fact, today, if you're here and you've never received it, this is what's known as the gospel, the good news that God, through his son, provided redemption for you, that you can receive that by faith. We'd love to come alongside you if that's you. That's a step you want to take today. In fact, you can even mark that on your card and put it in the buckets as they come around later. We'd love to be a support to you, pray for you, resource you if we can. and encourage you to think about signing up for Alpha. For those of you who have put their faith in Jesus, remember, this is a text telling us that not only has God revealed to us past tense, he is revealing himself to us in an ongoing manner. He does that through nature. So how are some ways that you could perhaps draw closer to him through nature? So ways that you can build that into your, I I mean, seriously, how do we explore this place? Maybe you guys like to work out. You guys could do that and think about the Lord. I mean, that's an option. I don't know. But the point is, figure something out. Try to find a way where you feel special closeness to God, whether it's on walks, hikes, whatever it might be, getting away. He reveals himself through his word. Again, this one ought to be kind of straightforward for those of us who've been following him for a while. But it's, it's just to say the force of this is if it's so beautiful and brings so much joy to our hearts, precious as gold, sweeter than honey, are we actually treating it as such? And what are ways that you can, if you haven't been, or ways you can get back to if you had been before? If you need help with that, come see me. I'd love to talk to you about it. And then last but not least, it's revealed that he's our redeemer. If there's some sin that's weighing you down right now, sin that you feel in your conscience, just know that the Lord sees you, sees it, and forgives, loves, cares for you. You can bring it to him, and he'll receive it. Wonderful ways that he reveals himself to us. How can we go to him as our Lord, our rock, our redeemer, and all these things, even this week? Let's pray. Father, it really is mind-boggling that you would reveal yourself to us at all, especially given our track record. You created us to be in perfect relationship with you, and we rejected you. That you continue to make yourself known to us and not just kind of in general, far-off ways, that we appreciate the many blessings you've given us through nature and all the rest of it, but in, in personal ways, through your, through your word and through your spirit even, and of course through your son and what you did for us, each of us on the cross. I pray if there's anybody here today who's never received you, that today would be the day they put their faith in you, even now, and receive life forever, being brought into your eternal family. And, then, and I pray for those who have been following you for any length of time, that you would give them a fresh revelation in their life, whether that be through nature or your word or forgiveness or or all three. Would you draw each of us as individuals and as a church to yourself? We pray this in Jesus' name.